my Govanen. Welcome to Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm the Tolkien Geek. And recently in the Discord server that I opened, yes, I have a Discord server. You can join it by clicking the link in the description below. One of the people who joined posted a link to a script for The Lord of the Rings written, or at least written by or for John Boorman, who the only thing that I know that he directed was Excalibur way back in the day. And when I tell you that this script is absolutely nuts, I, yeah, that's a, that's an understatement. The, some of the stuff in it is so bad as to be comical because it's bad. Some of it is just bizarre. And I, I'm not even finished reading it yet. And I was going to make a video on it. And then I decided, no, there's too much here. I'm going to have to make at least two, probably three videos on it. So this is part one of a series covering some of the absolutely insane stuff in this John Borman script for The Lord of the Rings. So buckle in. We're going to have a really, really interesting ride. The movie actually opens with a fairly decent title screen. We start in Mount Doom with the lava in the background, and as the camera pans back from the lava to the outside of Mount Doom across the landscape of Mordor, and then Gondor and Rohan, and eventually ending in the Shire, we're getting in the background the ring verse being recited. This is actually kind of a nice title opening, I think. It would, it would kind of give you that sense of there's something really ominous and something really important about to happen here, give you kind of a preview, but not really, of what's coming. And, you know, it, it ends in a place where it's setting the stage for what's about to happen. That's almost the last good thing that happens in this script, at least by page 70, by my account about where I'm at right now. So it doesn't get any better from here. Uh, it gets a lot worse. Once we reach the Shire and the titles end, what we get is kind of like the Ralph Bakshi film where we start just in the middle of Bilbo's birthday party, which is fine. I mean, the lead up to the party is not really all that important for the most part, and if you're going to try to cover the Lord of the Rings in a relatively short cinematic space, I don't see any reason not to skip to this. But the way it's handled is really weird, and you can tell that they're compressing time a lot, because Bilbo is, like in the Bakshi film, giving his speech. But in terms of giving his speech, he does not do it like he does in the book, or even the Bakshi film, where he gives it straightforwardly and then disappears. Rather, he starts his speech and then Gandalf shows up at kind of in the middle of it after Bilbo has already kind of faltered and we get the idea that he's actually not wanting to leave. And Gandalf Gandalf's role in this is to push him to give the final version of the speech where he tells the the hobbits of the Shire goodbye. He's not wanting to do that as part of the speech, which of course is in contrast to the original story where he thinks the whole thing is a great joke. He's leaving regardless. It's only really the ring that he doesn't want to give up. So we get this weird scene where Bilbo kind of tries to escape Gandalf's notice and gets dancing in the middle of the crowd of hobbits and Gandalf you know, catches up to him and dances with him and then dances him out of the party into his own garden so he can get him alone. And we get this weird mix of the party and Gandalf and Bilbo's final meeting in Bag End in the book being all kind of combined into this party slash garden scene. And it's, it, it's, you could tell the time compression was the main factor going for how they decided to do this. And it just, it's weird. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, we also get this brief look at Frodo, and the script, I kid you not, says that he ends up either looking at or dancing with a Bugsum Hobbit lass. It's like, Frodo's a confirmed bachelor. Was that really necessary? But whatever. Uh, Gandalf, as I said, eventually gets him alone and, you know, convinces him to leave, and he brings up the ring... And Bilbo puts up about 
four seconds of resistance and says, I don't want to leave it, and Gandalf bristles at him, and he's like, okay, fine. And that's it. I mean, you wouldn't get the idea that the ring really had a whole lot of hold on him at all. It's more like, this is just my personal possession, and I really like it. Why should I give it up? But hey, if you're going to get really angry, Mr. Wizard, then I'll just do whatever. And the way Gandalf handles it, since they're not in Bag End, and he can't put it in an envelope on the mantelpiece, he holds out his hat and has Bilbo drop it in that. Okay, so we kind of covered m pretty much most of the first chapter here in just a couple of minutes. Now the story starts to take really strange turns away from the source material. The next main thing that we see is Frodo dozing on the party lawn because it's really late and, you know, guests have gone home or whatever. And he kind of wakes up with, you know, a few things moving around or whatever. And then he sees or thinks he sees something in, you know, the distance in the dark, which the way it's described in the script, it's clearly a black rider. And he sees it briefly, but then it's gone and he thinks maybe he was just dreaming and so he goes back to Bag End. Now, this is going to become really problematic really soon, and you'll see why. Uh, when he gets to Bag End, Gandalf tells him that Bilbo left, but that he left him the ring. And Gandalf here actually encourages Frodo to put on the ring. And it's uh, that on its own terms is a horrible idea, but Frodo picks up the ring and he starts to try to put it on, but he can't bring himself to do it. And the script de describes him as getting really hyped up or maybe even convulsing. And the next thing you know, Gandalf is trying to stop him from putting on the ring. And in doing so, they end up in a little bit of a scuffle where their hands are kind of confused. And in the confusion, the ring falls to the, to the ground. And then, to Gandalf's horror... Frodo, in some kind of a trance-like state, repeats some lines from the ring verse, and then Gandalf's like, where did you learn that? And the whole thing is so weird. Why did Gandalf want him to put on the ring? What was he expecting? And It's so weird. But anyway, after all of this happens, Frodo, of course, is like super worried, because why wouldn't you be? You just tried to put on a simple ring to test out its invisibility, and you found that you were... Ah, this is weird. And so he tries to give it to Gandalf, and Gandalf's like, no, it's only safe with somebody simple like you. Not meaning that as an insult, obviously, but Frodo kind of seems to at least half-jokingly take it as maybe an insult. Um, shortly after this conversation, though, Sam, Pippin, and Merry all burst in. And by the way, Merry in this movie is described as the fat hobbit. Pippin is described as the skinny hobbit. Sam doesn't get a whole lot of description, actually. Um, but anyway, they burst into Bag End, and it's basically the scene from Bree where Mary bursts in when they're all when the other hobbits are all talking to Strider, and he has encountered a Black Rider. So all three of these hobbits who were at the party earlier were, you know, out and about walking away from the party or whatever, and apparently encountered the Black Rider, probably the one that Frodo saw or half saw in his drowsy state. And so they end up, you know, getting in there in a panic and telling Gandalf and Frodo this. Gandalf, as a result, uh, seems kind of unconcerned. He's feigning, you know, that he's not really all that concerned about what's going on. But he says that there are evil things passing through the Shire and that it might be a good idea for the hobbits to go on a holiday to Rivendell. And, you know, the other hobbits are really excited about the idea of going to see the elves, although Sam isn't the one who mentions that. I think it's actually Pippin. So, I mean, the, the way these different bits and pieces of, you know, seemingly trivial things get attached to different characters, just it just continues to mount. At any rate, he basically says, you should leave right now, and sends them off on their own, as day is breaking, since the party ran late and now it's, you know, near dawn, and sends them off on their own, knowing that there is a Black Rider in the vicinity. I, oh my! I mean, just the sheer irresponsibility of Gandalf in this scene is incredible. He's already tried to get Frodo to put on the ring. 
obviously not knowing what it was, but still. And then now that there's a black writer out and about, and he seems to at least have some idea what that means, he's sending them off to potentially go get in another encounter with this black writer without going with them. It's absolutely nuts. And to top it all off, Gandalf tells Frodo, don't wear the ring unless you have to. Which, of course, is not what he tells him in the book. He's like, never, ever wear it. Period. And, and so, you know, right off the bat, it's just, there's so many things wrong with this whole thing. And this is right after he just told him to put it on. I mean, what was Gandalf's purpose in telling him to put it on in the first place? You have to wonder. We never really find this out in the script. Uh, and then right after that, he's saying, don't put it on unless you really have to. Well, in what circumstance would he really have to, Gandalf, when he's facing a black rider who's going to be able to find him even better if he puts it on? Like, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. It, don't ask me to explain it. Like I said, this just gets worse. As the hobbits then make their journey across the Shire, we get some more just weird stuff. And and here you can tell that this was going to be a product of the 70s. Uh, <laughs> They're traipsing along in the Shire, and it specifically notes that it's springtime, which is, you know, a minor detail, but it's incorrect because Frodo really left the Shire in September, not springtime, but whatever, we'll give it a pass. Uh, even if he had left at Bilbo's party, it would have been September, but okay, fine. So they're walking across the Shire. They happen across a field full of mushrooms, and of course hobbits love mushrooms, so they start gobbling up mushrooms, and apparently these are the kind of mushrooms that could get you into legal trouble <laughs> because they soon start kind of getting giggly and hallucinating things. And it starts off with some kind of nice hallucinations. And by nice, I mean nice by some standard. It's not creepy, in other words, except it kind of is because like the first hallucination they have is... They're in this field, which looks kind of like an idyllic farm field or something, but there's a bunch of naked children running around in playful, you know, attitude. But it's like, why did they have to be naked children? I mean, so that's your first hint that, you know, that it's the 70s. They eat mushrooms and they start hallucinating naked kids running around in a farm field. I, whatever. The hallucinations start to get creepier, though, and they get, you know, hallucinations of a really creepy forest and, you know, a bunch of stuff happens that they, you know, get, that sobers them up a little bit. That's actually the words used in the script, by the way. They are sobered by their creepier hallucinations. Sober. Uh, so we know what the, <laughs> we know what the mushrooms are doing. Um, and then we get to a point where they're wandering around, and it's not clear that they left the Shire yet. It's not clear exactly where they are, but they run into some men, hum, you know, human, not hobbit, men, working in their own fields. And one of them says, you know, that he saw a halfling, and the other guy's like, well, catch him. There's a big reward for catching halflings. And you're just sitting there going, why is there a reward for halflings? Did Sauron put out a bounty? Is just this just a thing that happens in Middle Earth, I, it never explains it. And and so we're left to wonder, why is there a reward for halflings anyway? Uh, so they have to run from these men in their fields doing, you know, trying to catch them for whatever reward money there is for halflings. And it just continues to get crazier, by the way. After this narrow escape, they end up having their first encounter with a black rider. They're walking along the road, and they hear galloping coming. And so they get off-road and hide. The galloping stops. The black rider gets down, starts sniffing. You know, this it's its a pretty standard idea of the, you know, the, the first black rider encounter. It's really not all that different from the main story. What gets weird, though, is after this encounter, they end up stopping for dinner... And then while they're sitting there, Frodo feels the presence of another rider coming, and so they start to get up and get ready, and then they just run. And apparently they're chased for some time by black riders until they come to a forest. And this is clearly something like the old forest, although geographically where we are, who knows at this point. 
because we've already encountered men, so it's clearly not just right on the borders of the Shire. But anyway, the forest looks kind of creepy, but the forest moves to let them in, but then seems to bar the Black Rider's entrance by closing back in, which is kind of weird in itself. But they get further into the woods until they no longer hear any signs of pursuit, and next thing you know, one of the hobbits is getting tripped by a root, and then another hobbit, I think it's Pippin first and then Mary, and Mary, of course, is like, ah, you didn't get tripped, you're just being silly, then he gets tripped, and then things kind of escalate from there to the point where Sam threatens to attack the tree with an axe, and then the trees get really mad, and Sam accidentally, like, falls into one or whatever, and he gets super apologetic about it and starts to use some of Tom Bombadil's lines from the book about drink water, go to sleep, you know, eat earth, dig deep, drink water, go to sleep, and they start chanting this to get the, the trees to calm down. And the whole thing is weird, because if the trees were on their side to begin with, why are they suddenly tripping up the hobbits as if they're enemies? Uh, and then it just, it just, it doesn't make any sense. Don't ask it to. But at the end of the scene, they end up getting the tree to calm down by, you know, chanting to it. <laughs> After threatening to hack it down with an axe, so there's that. But anyway, the tree opens up and they sleep inside the tree. And when they wake the next morning, they're at the very edge of the forest facing an open countryside, so seemingly the tree moved in the middle of the night and brought them to the edge of the forest to continue their journey, not knowing really where they are at this point. So they continue on their journey, and it's a foggy day, and the next thing you know, they're hearing more hoofbeats and thinking that black riders are near. Now, they have a bunch of close encounters with the black riders. They're, you know, trying to stay hidden and escape or whatever in the fog so I mean it's not like they're you know just wide open but still they keep trying to get away from all these galloping hoofbeats and the next thing you know another horse rides right up to him and a man dismounts and it's it's Strider we don't learn his name for I don't even know how long uh, I don't think I've read his name one time and I'm way further than this in the script he just calls himself a ranger and asks for Frodo and clearly he knows what Frodo is carrying uh, and they don't trust him, but they're in a bad situation, so of course they kind of have to do something. But anyway, he leads them on a run. Oh, and by the way, he arrives on a horse, and I'm not exactly sure how things go from here. It doesn't describe it, but it says that they're running away from the Black Riders. I assume he must not have mounted again, so he must be leading it by hand. But in any event, the hobbits aren't really able to keep up with him, so he basically tells them to turn and fight. And here we get one of my favorite moments, because Aragorn crosses his arms and draws two swords. And by two swords, I mean the hilt shard and the broken blade shard, which has been attached to a makeshift handle so that now Strider, or the ranger, which is really all we know him as at this point, is dual-wielding swords. And by the way, the Black Riders are still attacking on horseback, some of them with lances, not swords. Really ugly situation to be in, no matter what your circumstances, especially in a fog. But anyway, they start trying to fight off the Black Riders. Frodo starts to go into a bit of a ring trance because, you know, whatever. And eventually puts on the ring. Then, of course, the Black Riders can see him perfectly well. The fog is basically non-existent in the Wraith world, so they can see him perfectly well. One of them rides right at him with a lance, not a Morgul dagger. <laughs> and time slows down as he hears this huge clamor of voices, and in the mix, Gandalf is trying to warn him to take off the ring. And time slows down to the point where the, the spear point is basically right above him as he's trying to fall backwards to dodge it. And it... It, time basically halts at that point, and then he takes off the ring and falls, but the spear still catches him in the shoulder, and he falls down. And the riders keep trying to attack him, but now that he has the ring off, apparently they can't 
even see him at all, which is also not correct based on what we get in the books. But hey, whatever. Um, and Ar- Aragorn slash Strider slash the Ranger attacks again and scares them off. After the other, after the Black Riders have run off, though, he gathers the hobbits together, thinks for a bit, and eventually puts all four of them on his own horse. So there's no Glorfindel, no Arwen, no Legolas, no nothing. Um, puts them all on his own horse. How four hobbits are supposed to ride on a horse? I don't know. Um, but and basically just sends them to the river, leaving him behind. So they're you know dashing for the river. We have the scene where the riders converge on him, try to keep him from making it to the river, but they do make it to the river, of course. In the middle of crossing the river, some of the black riders are following them, but a bunch of elves riding riding ponies, yes, ponies, uh, come from down the river at behind a wave and start, you know, jousting, that's literally the word in the script, the black riders off their horses and knocking them into the water. Only one rider has stayed behind, and is not in the river. As the riders fall into the water, they start to dissolve into like a black slime or something, and so it leaves open the possibility that maybe they're actually dead, or maybe they are still alive but have to be reformed into something after that. I don't know yet. Haven't got that far. Um, But anyway, that's what the elven pony riders are doing. And Frodo falls into the river trying to cross it, but an elf grabs him and picks him up. And then Strider comes from behind, and one the one last black rider's horse rears up, and he runs and just shoves it into the river and topples it backwards. I, I don't know this for sure, but I have a feeling if a horse reared up and you picked even a rather large and strong guy, that guy would probably not be able to topple the horse backwards. I could be wrong about that, but I I have my suspicions. Anyway, that's the end of the river scene. And then the next thing we know, it gets really weird again. Because Frodo wakes up in Rivendell on a large circular table. Apparently he's wearing nothing but covered by leaves. And there's a black ooze seeping out of his shoulder wound. Incidentally, Rivendell has already been described at this point because the hobbits saw it from across the river, and it's a crystal palace. Elrond is is described as a king. Surrounding the table on which Frodo is laid are a bunch of people. Kings, elves, dwarves, you know, Strider, Gandalf the hobbits. I mean, like, everybody's there. Um, (laughs) It's it's such a strange scene, and it just gets weirder from here, by the way. Um, Gandalf looks at his wound and sees the black ooze coming out, and he says, he mutters wraith essence under his breath, kind of, and says that Frodo is still fading. And actually, the scene, the script describes Frodo's arm as fading so that we can actually see the bone inside it. So he's actually turning into a wraith before our eyes. So that's, you know, a really fast reaction compared to what we get in the books. Again, time compression is just insane in this script. Elrond turns to a figure who is, you know, squatting by the fire, waving a, I think it says waving a hand, but I I think what it really means is there's a hand, but it's holding a knife, because that's what we end up seeing used. And this figure is described as a 13-year-old girl, and guess who it is? It's Arwen. Arwen gets to perform the surgery on Frodo, which is, I don't understand it, but anyway, Arwen... Uh, And she's described as a 13-year-old, okay? And and things are going to get weird about that. So Elrond is going to have her perform surgery on Frodo, and he tells Gimli, the Lord of the Axe, quote-unquote, I don't know what that means, (laughs) uh, to come over and stand by Arwen, and if Arwen should swoon while she's trying to get whatever out of Frodo, that Gimli needs to just chop Frodo's arm off. We're going to do really massive surgery here if things go wrong because apparently we're going to have to remove that limb so it doesn't spread to the rest of the body. So anyway, we get this scene where Arwen is actively performing surgery on Frodo's arm. Gimli's just standing there with his axe raised, ready to let it fall if he needs to. In the background, the elves are all chanting. 
Why, I don't know. And apparently there's some kind of contest of wills between Arwen and Sauron. It's not just surgery. There's also something spiritual going on here. Why that is, I don't know. Um, and Boromir is here, by the way. Boromir is here for the surgery. Why all these people are here for the surgery, whatever. But Boromir, and this is a, a thing that's going to continue for the rest of the script, as far as I can tell so far. Boromir is not just somewhat brash and rather proud of himself. He is extremely impetuous to the point of comedy. He will do things that are just bombastic and silly and anyway he gets up and starts saying why are we making all this fuss over a halfling Minas Tirith is standing alone and y'all are doing nothing I say we take the ring Gandalf tells him you know that Sauron is gonna you know have dominion over Frodo if, if the wraith process finishes or whatever and it's at that point, really, that Boromir says, well, why don't we just take the ring? And Gandalf says, well, go ahead and try. And so Boromir goes over and tries, but he can't bring himself to actually reach for the ring. The inconsistency about the ring and how it works and how you can put it on and how you can't put it on makes absolutely no sense. Frodo tried to put it on in Bag End, couldn't do it. Tried not to put it on when the Black Riders were attacking and eventually did with no you know, his effort was entirely in the other direction. Boromir just tries to grab the thing, and now he can't do it. Which, okay, maybe in Boromir's case, it's because of whatever's going on between Arwen and Sauron. Who knows? I don't know. It's just weird. Uh, but, you know, this is what happens. So, at a couple of points, Arwen almost swoons, and Gimli thinks he's going to have to cut off the arm, and the tension builds, and the next thing you know, she finally gets a black splinter out of the arm, and everything is fine, and Frodo wakes up, and we're good. And we immediately go into the Council of Elrond, which is really weird, because Elrond starts kind of narrating, and then we get these people come in as players in some kind of a play, and in fact, at one point, it's described as being, their, their acting is described as exaggerated like a kabuki play. Um, this is just the words of the script, people. I'm just relaying. I'm not making any criticisms. Um, but, I mean, if you've seen a kabuki play, you know what I'm talking about. The exaggerated movements, the, you know, the kinds of things in a kabuki play that seem exaggerated by a modern cinema standard, let's say. Um, and there, the play is basically giving the history of the forging of the rings, which they get wrong because they say, well, the elves forged it, and then Sauron stole the secret and betrayed him. It's like, well, no, Sauron was the one who taught him how to do it in the first place, really, but okay, fine, we're going to just skip over that. Um, the forging of the rings, the battle of the last alliance, except there is no Isildur, it's just a Lindil. Um, and the weird thing is the... the I don't even understand this because they don't explain it, but apparently when Sauron dies, his ring just falls into the river. I don't know. Don't ask. Also, Elendil is described as the king of Minas Tirith, which is also wrong, but hey, time compression, and we're just going to skip all that legendary history and get straight to the point, right? At the end of the play, well, no, not the end of the play, at the end of the Battle of the Last Alliance, of course, the ring falls into the river, and the river, they're doing it by, you know, like waving a blue cloth and the ring falls beneath it. That's the river. So this is the kind of play that they're putting on. And some of the description of it seems like somebody was on, on an acid trip. So again, 70s. <laughs> um, anyway, after that, we do see Smeagol murder Diagol. We also see two wizards, and apparently there's only two. And it's Gandalf and Saruman. Uh, Saruman becomes... Um, I'm trying to think of the right word, enamored, entranced, not entranced, just, you know, gets, is kind of attracted to Sauron in some strange ways and starts um, arguing with Gandalf, and we're basically getting Gandalf and Saruman's dispute, but it, it's, it's unclear when this actually happened in history. Um, and then, you know, we've got Sauron in the background all the time, doing things, trying to regain his ring. And by the way, some of the some of the costumes are described in ways that I'm just like, that would look so weird. And I'm not even, I'm not sure if I'm just not understanding it, but whatever. Uh, 
So anyway, all of this is going on. Bilbo obtains the ring. I mean, the play is going to basically bring the entire history of the ring to us in this one very quick summary. And at the end of the process of Bilbo getting the ring, we then have the real Gandalf take over for the play Gandalf and start talking about a few things. And Boromir jumps up and he points to the play sword that broke under a Lindil in the play and he says that's the broken sword and blah 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 and then Aragorn says well look here's the broken sword and they have a little face off and all this and they don't really go into Aragorn or Strider or the Rangers lineage they don't really go into any of that he just possesses the sword that's all we know and then rather than having an actual extended debate about okay we got the ring what do we do with it now Gandalf rhetorically and that's the word used in the script again asks Elrond a bunch of questions like, could we hide it? Could we throw it in the, in the sea? Could we destroy it? Could we, you know, and it, basically asking him rhetorically, here's all the things we can't do, so what do we have to do? And Elrond, of course, eventually gets around to the point, we have to throw the thing in the fire. After, of course, he makes this, Bilbo then says, okay, I can see what you're driving at. Bilbo the Silly Hobbit started this mess, and Bilbo the Silly Hobbit better finish it. But apparently both Elrond and Gandalf look at him like, no. Uh, and so then Frodo volunteers. And then we move directly to the Fellowship walking. And we're going to get to that in the next video because I've already gone long enough in this one. All we've gotten to is Rivendell. And just look at the insanity that we have covered. The ring is completely inconsistent. Characters are just kind of whack. And, and by whack, I mean like who is... Like I said, I don't think up to this point we've ever learned what... The ranger's name is, he's carrying two swords. Boromir knows what the broken sword is, but, I mean, we don't know much about him besides the fact that he's from Minas Tirith. Uh, we've got a 13-year-old Arwen, and we haven't even gotten to why that's weird yet. We're going to get to that in the next video. <laughs> uh, but it'll get weird. And just the way the hobbits act, and then the way Gandalf is completely irresponsible, it's a mess. This entire script is a complete mess from any kind of standpoint. I mean, and the time compression is just so extreme. I mean, you you can tell that they were trying to fit the entire thing into one movie because they combine weird elements of Brie with Hobbiton and then they combine weird elements of the old forest into part of their trip and then they combine... Just, I mean, like, Aragorn doesn't even meet him in Bree. We don't get Bree. We don't get, you know, we kind of get the old forest, but we certainly don't get Bombadil and the Barrow Downs. You know, although you could say maybe the fog that they're traveling through is kind of a reference to the Barrow Downs. It's just, you can see that they're trying to capture all the major elements of the story in some way or another because they quote Tom Bombadil whenever... Sam is trying to get this tree to relax. You've got, like I said, the fog that could represent the Barrow Downs. You've got the Bree scene where Mary runs into the Black Rider, but it happens in Hobbiton. Like, they're taking all of these elements, and they're just squeezing them into this really short thing. And it forces them to make really silly decisions, like Gandalf's just going to let the Hobbits go on their own. Where did Gandalf go? What did he do? I mean, we get this play where we see Gandalf and Saruman and Saruman clearly becomes corrupted and they have this argument but when did that happen Gandalf just sent the hobbits out just a few days ago seemingly so when did he have time to go and consult with Saruman when did all this happen it doesn't make any sense it's so weird and it just gets weirder I promise it's gonna get weirder in the next video so anyway I will leave it there for now this is part one of probably three We'll see how that works out. Um, but anyway, if if <laughs> if you want to hear more stuff like this, or maybe something less silly, uh, do subscribe, do like the video, share it around. If you're on YouTube, make sure you click that bell icon so you catch all my content. I'm also on Odyssey Rumble. I have podcast versions on most podcatchers as well. You can also follow me on Twitter at JRRTLore for some occasional Tolkien-related trivia questions. Uh, don't forget about that Discord server that I've opened up. You can throw stuff at me over there like this that might give me really good ideas for future videos. And you could support me over at Patreon. Until the next time, when we talk about this craziness some more, 
I'm the Tolkien Geek, signing out for the Tolkien Lore Channel. Namarie. Thanks to all my Patreon patrons, especially Ringbearer Ego Voice and Elf Friends PA Brew News, Deanna Kaufman, Tracy Meehan, and Nathan Dufour.